He did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road. But the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. I have a message that the Lord's put in my heart today entitled, The Cross of Christ. You know, there's so much that God has done for us through the work of the cross. He secured our salvation. He secured our healing, our deliverance, our peace, our peace of mind. He's done so much and he used the cross to do it. The cross was a, is an emblem how many of you know the old song, The Old Rugged Cross? It says, an emblem of shame. They crucified the worst criminals on the cross. And that's the way they treated Jesus as a worst criminal. But where does it start? Where did the cross start? It started all the way from the beginning. When Adam and Eve fell and they brought us into a place of sin... God said, I'm going to redeem my people back to me. So in John 3, 16, one of the most well-known verses, one of the most memorized verses of all the Bible, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved us so much he could not stand the fact that we would be separated from him forever unless he sent his son, Jesus Christ. He sent the very, very best that he had to send. He sent a part of himself. Because when Jesus came, he came in flesh and blood, and he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus came in flesh and blood just like you and I, so that he could perfectly identify with our plight uh, as being humans could identify with the human race. It says that he was tempted in all ways, but without sin. Just as you are tempted, he was tempted, but he didn't sin. He didn't give in to the temptations. If he was helping Joseph in the carpenter's shop and he hit his thumb with the hammer, it hurt. Just like if we hit our thumb with the hammer, it hurt. <laughs> it will hurt, right? He was flesh and blood like us, but he lived this life perfectly and fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, every dot and every T crossed of the law. He fulfilled it perfectly and he fulfilled all righteousness for us because we were not able to keep it. Is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants you to be saved. It says in the New Testament that he came to seek and save the lost. We're all, we have all been in a position where we need to be saved. We were all born into sin. And we're all in need of a savior. But he sent his son because he's loved us so, so very much. He didn't come to condemn us, to judge us, but to bring us to God. God sent him as the, the, the mediator between God and man. Jesus was talking with his disciples. And he asked them point blank, who, who do men say that I am? What's the talk around town? What are they saying about me? Verse 18, it says, And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. Who do the crowd say that I am? And so they answered and said, Well, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say the, an, a prophet from the Old Testament is risen again. And he said to him, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You're my disciples. You're, you're my close friends. You're my inner circle. Who do you say that I am? And I believe the Lord is asking us the same question today. Who do you say that he is? Who is he to you? 
And Peter had the right answer. And it was given to him by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit revealed it in him. And he said, and Jesus said to him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. The Christ of God, the, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my spirit. Who do we think Jesus is? Was he just a good man? Was he just a prophet? Is he a fairy tale in some book? Is he a good teacher? Is he just a, a religious object that we hang around our neck on a cross? Is Jesus a little fetish that you hang on your rear view windshield for protection? Is Jesus the picture that you have hanging in the house? Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? He is the son of the living God. And he was sent because God loved you so very much. And he died for your sins and for mine on the cross. We have to believe who he is. In verse 21, Jesus goes on to say, and he strictly, strictly warned them and commanded them to tell no one, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised the third day. He told them very plainly why he came, that he would be crucified, that he would be buried and that he would rise again. Verse 23, then he said to all of them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever des desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it mean to take up your cross daily? You know, I thought about Jesus when they told him he had to carry his own cross to Gol Golgotha, the place of the skull. And it said that Simon of Cyrene was there and when Jesus couldn't carry it anymore, they pressed him in and they told him, you gotta carry the cross for him. But Jesus said, we've gotta take up our cross and follow him daily. What does that mean anyway? That means we need to give up our own will and our own way to follow him. Because many times our will and our way are completely contrary to the ways of God. He said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. What does that mean? When we give everything to him, he gives everything to us. God gave us his very best, and Jesus laid down his life willingly for all. You know, when I think about it, he had no guarantee that anyone would turn to him. He did it because he loved the Father and he loved us. He laid his life down willingly. He said, no one takes it from me, I lay it down. You know, salvation is free, but it will cost us everything. We got to give him our life. He needs to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's got to be master and savior. He said, take it up daily. Sometimes it's day by day, choice by choice, minute by minute, hour by hour to follow him. Especially if we're struggling in something, something that's pulling on us from the world. But if we give our life to him so completely, we will save our life. You know, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Jesus encountered a young man, the Bible calls him a rich young ruler. Though he was rich and he was young. 
Have you ever done anything in your life and you just chalked it up to being young and dumb? I have. <laughs> I say that a lot. Well, that's just young and dumb. They don't know better yet. <laughs> just give them, just excuse them and give them a little grace. They're just young and dumb. <laughs> but they'll figure it out. But Jesus encountered a young man. Verse, uh, Matthew 19, starting with verse 16, he said, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? I thought that was an interesting question. Why would he ask that when, when Jesus told him, follow the commandments? And he said, well, I followed them all, but I believe Intuitively, he knew that there was something lacking. He said, what else do I lack? And this is what Jesus told him. If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away, went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. He was thinking about what he might lose instead of what he might gain. Many times when the Lord is calling us, we feel the call of God in us. We feel that pull when there's an altar call given in a service. We feel him pulling us and drawing us with cords of love. There's a little, but there's a little voice in the back of our head sometimes that's thinking about the thing that the Lord may have us lay down, the thing that we may have to stop or give up or change in our life to truly walk with him. But we need to consider all that we gain. We gain eternal life in Jesus Christ. There is nothing this world has that compares to glory. Nothing this world has that can even hold a candle to God and all that he has in store for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, not even entered into the heart of man that what God has laid up for us. It's going to be amazing. I tell you, we're not going to float around on little clouds like cherubs with a harp being bored. That's not how it's going to happen. We're going to be in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. And his presence is so heavy and so strong. The kabod of his glory will come down and we'll worship him. And we'll be just enthroned in his, his presence. And it's not going to be boring. It's going to be amazing. It'll be the, it's the best church service you've ever been in. It'll be better than any concert. It'll be better than any worship service. His presence will be so near. I tell you, it's not going to be boring in heaven. I tell you where you don't want to go is hell. It's not going to be boring there either, but. It says where there's utter darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the fire is not quenched and the worm never dies. The horrible place. That's our choice. <laughs> Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. This young man was young and dumb. He walked away from following Christ because he couldn't let go of his possessions. His worldly things meant more to him than his eternal life. Is there anything that means more to you than your eternal life? If there is, it's become an idol in your life. And God said that we're not going to have, we shouldn't have any other gods before him. There's nothing in my life that I would not lay down for him if he asked me. 
I don't know what it would be. It might be something different in your life than my life. Sometimes he asks us to lay down things that are not bad, but good, because he has something different for us. He says, no, I want you to lay that down because I want you to go in this direction. Are we willing to let him be Lord? Don't ever think about what you may be losing, but think about what you're gaining. In Matthew 19, verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. And they said, who can be saved then? They're like, man, salvation is too hard. Who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. When the Lord, amen, when the Lord puts his hand on your life, there is grace there. Grace is the power to overcome anything in your life. Grace is the power to do anything in your life. The grace is there. With men, it's impossible. We can't do it in our own strength. We're not gonna serve God out of our carnal mind nor our carnal nature. We're gonna serve him by his spirit, through his grace, because all things are possible through God. Have you ever had someone in your family and they were the, like the hardest case? I mean, maybe they were an atheist or maybe they were just so far away from God or so strung out on drugs or just, I mean, their life was a mess. And you thought, oh man, there's, there's no way this person's ever gonna get saved. <laughs> That's the one God likes to go after. That's the one that God likes to, to draw and touch. The hard cases, because he can. And then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and we followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Peter. You know, Jesus says this and right away he speaks up, well, we've given everything away. We've done everything, right, Lord? <laughs> he was looking for a little uh, pat on the back. So Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne of glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, say everyone, say that's me. Whatever you have had to give up for Christ, listen what it says. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or land for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. I tell you what a trade. We get the best into the deal. <laughs> what a trade. He's given us everything. But he said, but many who are first will be last and last will be first. Many of those that we think are so prominent in this world, so powerful, so rich, they'll be the least in the kingdom of God. And the humble and the meek will be the ones that will be greater. The things of this world don't compare to the glory of heaven in the glory of God. The things in this earth are temporal. That means that they're not going to last. It says heaven and earth will pass away. One day all the stars, it says, are gonna fall from the sky. It's gonna be over. And we're gonna have a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Everything in this earth is temporal. It will leave, it will die, it will decay, it will be gone. But everything in heaven is eternal. Everything we have with God is eternal. 
Our salvation is eternal forever and ever and ever. And we'll be with him in his presence. The only thing we get to take out of this world are those that we went to Christ. They are the ones that are going to meet us in the air. They're the ones that are going to meet us at the gate. When we hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Those people that we have won to Christ, I believe they're going to be there at the gate. They're going to be welcoming us in. There's going to be a great reunion with our grandparents and our great-grandparents who are in Christ. Maybe you have a child or a brother or a sister. Maybe you lost a baby. They're in heaven being raised by the angels of God, and they will know you when you get there. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that gives me goosebumps. <laughs> they are not lost forever. They are waiting for you. They are waiting for you. I'm going to go ahead and have our uh, ushers begin to serve the communion. And as we serve the communion, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Roberto and uh, Pastor Pedro to come up. And I want them to share a little bit of their testimony. They shared it in the Spanish service this morning. and I wanted them to share it today with you as well. Check, check. Morning. How are you? Um, I wanted to share some of my testimony about how I, um, the Lord saved me. It's not like a, a huge uh, breakthrough or story. Uh, it was like a transitioning. But all everything started when my, my family... We, we visit the church, and the reason about visiting that church was because my sister was sick. She had asthma, and during her life, several times she was about to die in several occasions. She lived all, most, most of her childhood in hospitals, and I lived most of my childhood being taken care of uh, with other people. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, can you can you take can you uh, watch him while we are in the hospital? Kind of like that. And one time, my parents were invited to this church. They tried everything before. They tried medic uh, doctors and medicines of, the, of all kinds. Um, even bad things like um, witch, witches or um, curanderos, uh, healers. They try everything to save my sister. Um, and nothing worked until that day on that church. We met God and someone prayed for her and she was healed. Hallelujah. From and <laughs> I'm sure the enemy was uh, mad because that day when we came back from the church, some, uh, some, a car, it was like a big car accident. And we were involved. And yeah, that's another story. But <laughs> when, when the Lord does something in your life, the enemy is angry, okay? That's another story, but later, um, I was maybe 10 years old, eight, 10 years old. We started going to church. I, don't, I didn't knew anything about the Lord, about church. The only thing I knew is that my mom used to uh, take me, like forcing me to go to church every Sunday, and I didn't want it to go. I was a teenager, a kid. I didn't understand uh, that things, but she kept um, taking me to church every Sunday, every Sunday, sending me to the, the youth camps, the conferences, the um, BBS, everything. Uh, and I lived through all of that. And 
now I say, oh, thank you, Mom. <laughs> because everything that she um, sees in me, I can, I can see the... I can see now the um, fulfillment of God's work in, in my life. And that's why also I encourage you to keep sending your teenagers with Pastor Simeon. Uh, we saw the video, the, the, the youth camp, awesome. They're going to be touched there by the Lord. So keep sending them. If, if you miss this year, send them the, the next one. And uh, going, um, the, years, the years passed, and I keep going to church, but I didn't know anything about the spirit of the Lord. So one time, this pastor came to a, to a house because we needed some help with some spiritual issues in our house, like voices and shadows and those kinds of stuff. And he prayed for us, and he became our pastor. He became my pastor. He taught me everything about the spiritual warfare, the spiritual things. And I, I started then, then, when I was 15 years old, I, it's when I started serving the Lord in the worship. And that, that's when I started my ministry. And that's when, when I um, delivered my life to the Lord and, and make a commitment to serve him. and give him my youth and my, my life. And that's what I've been doing this past 15, 17 years. And, and now, I, now I see um, the, Lord, um, the Lord's work in my life. And I thank my mom for sending me and forcing me to go to church because every lesson that I learned, I carry it today with me. And, and thank you, God. God is awesome. <clears throat> Good morning. My story started uh, very early in life because we are born into a broken and fallen world. I was used and abused on, uh, uh, sexually at the age of five. And uh, I went through that several times. And uh, after I turned 10, I realized, I because before that, my innocence did not give me the acknowledgement of what had happened. but. When I turned 10 years old, I started realizing how much I had been hurt. And when I got to 12 years old, I started using smoking cigarettes. Little by little, I, I started using marijuana and then other drugs as well. And not only that, but I had an anger, a bitterness, a uh, resentment to anybody. I mean, anybody that I encountered, I would have something against them. I, and I could blame that situation for that. but. Uh, all in all, it's just that we are in a fallen world. It's very difficult to live in a world. That's why I do not live in a world that I do not live in that world anymore. Um, in uh, August 1996, the Lord touched me through a um, through the Holy Spirit. He came into me. He impregnated me with his being and, and gave me a, 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 a powerful love and tranquility and peace that just overwhelmed me. I, I, it's very hard to explain it. The only way I can explain it is for you to feel it as well. But uh, what I do see now is throughout life, we ask ourselves, where were you, Lord, when you were do when this happened to me? Where were you, Lord? That's the first question that comes to our mind. Well, the Lord is with us all the time. Even since we were in our mother's womb, he was taking care of us all the way through. The thing is that, like I said, this world is not our world. We need to get out of it. And uh, I got some scripture here that I'd like to share. There's some promises from God. I need my glasses. Even though, even though I can enlarge it, I still need my glasses. Matthew, Matthew 28, 20 tells us, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Genesis 28, 15 tells us, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to the land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Isaiah 41, 10 tells us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right arm, hand. Psalm 32, 8 tells us, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Exodus 33, 14 tells us, as he, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. All these are promises and there's a lot more promises from God in the Bible. I think there's well over 650 promises, but I just read a couple of them, but just several of them. But one of my favorites is from Job 13, 15, where he says, though he slay me, he didn't slay me, but though he slay me, I will hope in him. I will hope in him. And um, like I said, I, I'm not in the world anymore. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he will do the same for you. God bless you all. Amen. Hallelujah. I just have a couple of more scriptures for you. It says in Luke 9, 61 and 62, it says, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Those are some strong words from the Lord. Those that have put their hand to the plow, they're plowing, they're following God, but they keep looking back, looking back to the things of the past. Don't hold on to anything from the past. Don't yearn for the things of the world, but continue to follow him with a full heart. How do we make our way to the cross? How do we come to Jesus Christ? It says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead, that he's alive today? It says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You're going to believe in your heart and you're going to confess with your mouth that you believe in him and that you receive him as Savior. It's really easy to give your life to the Lord. And I want to give you an opportunity to pray and to give your life to the Lord today because he loves you so much. And he wants you to be part of him for eternity, forever and ever and ever. Your salvation is something that is eternal. Amen? I want you to pray this with me today. Say, Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that you raised him from the dead. I believe that he died for my sins and shed his blood to wash my sins away. Lord, I invite you to, to come into my heart, to be my Lord and Savior, to cleanse me of all of my sins, and to write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for loving me and saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna read you the scriptures for our communion today. They're found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 32. And there's some very important things that we need to listen to in this. It says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. God doesn't want us to be condemned with the world. Amen. And I'm going to give you a moment. If there's anything between you and God that you need to get right before we take communion, now is the time to do that. Maybe you have some unforgiveness. Maybe um, you're dealing with some things that you need to get right with God. So I'm going to give you a minute. We're just going to bow our head. We're going to take a minute, and I'm going to let you talk to God yourself directly. Amen? loving us, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for forgiving our sins as we forgive others who've sinned against us, Lord. Father, I pray that you help your people, Lord, to let go bitterness, let go of that bitterness, resentment, hatred, anger, Lord, to leave it in the past that they can go forward with you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Well, let's take our cup this morning. And if you peel off the little cellophane on the top, you can get to the little cracker. Well, let's show forth the bread this morning. Say it with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that this bread represents your body, which was broken for me. Thank you, Lord, for taking those stripes on your back for my healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Just peel the little foil back. Say it with me this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, this, that this cup represents your blood that was shed for me. Thank you that this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my new covenant, based on mercy and grace. Thank you for saving me and washing me in your blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. At this time, I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come to the front this morning. If you need individual prayer for anything today, our prayer partners would be happy to pray for you. If you're sick or have pain in your body, they will do according to James chapter 5. They will anoint you with oil and lay hands on you. And pray the prayer of faith over you and you'll be healed. We believe it. We believe what God's word says. Amen. So if you need prayer today, come and find one of these prayer partners. Some of them are still coming. Uh, Stand with me today. And I want to bless you before we go. If you like, take a hand there next to you. 
We're going to pronounce a blessing over you from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. And I want to remind you that my husband and I will be in the coffee stop over here in the corner. If you're visiting today or maybe we've never met personally, we'd love to meet you. So please come over there and, and join us. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.